And uh, this has nothing to do with my topic today, but I wanted to tell you about a, a man and a wife who went in for marital counseling to their pastor. And uh, they sat down and uh, she immediately began to explain what was wrong with their marriage. And it was uh, quite lengthy and she went on and on and on. And it seemed that she would never stop talking about what was wrong with their marriage. And the guy, he never said a word. And a little bit, the pastor got up from his chair and he walked around the desk and he picked the wife up and he planted one right on the smacker. He kissed her right on the lips. Put her back down, of course, now she stopped talking. Went back around, sat down in his chair, and he looked at the guy and he said, Sir, she needs that about two or three times a week. And the guy said, Well, Pastor, I can bring her by on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Sometimes we just don't get it. Uh, some, I know most of you. My name is Larry Granger. I pastor Abundant Life Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. Uh, one of the prettiest spots in the world. And uh, uh, I've been asked to share with you my journey of getting there. Of getting to Abundant Life Church. And I can tell you in advance, if you're sitting here, and are, are we online? If you're watching on Facebook or whatever, and you say to yourself, God called me, but I think he's forgot about me, then this is for you. Um, I'll, you know, I have to tell, back up and start near the beginning to, to get to the story, but as one guy I heard say one time, I was born at a very early age. <laughs> I didn't wake you up enough, I don't think. <laughs> My stroller as a child had square wheels. Um, uh, and see, here's the problem when, you, when you're trying to do something like this is what not to say. I was born in Panama City, Florida. Uh, ultimately, and, and it's been said this over and over again, I was in church when I was two weeks old and have been ever since. Thank God for a believing mother and uh, later a believing father, but even when my father was not a Christian, he was a good man, a good father, good provider. Uh, and so as a teenager, uh, I knew when I was early teens, 13, 14, I don't know how I knew, but I knew God was calling me to some kind of ministry. And of course, back then, uh, if you was called to do anything, you was called to be a pastor. We didn't know anything about five-fold ministries and things. At least I didn't. Not at 14 years old. Um, but it wasn't until I was like 16 that I finally completely surrendered my life to the Lord and, uh, and became started walking and living my life as a follower of Jesus Christ and then at the age of 18 maybe it was 17 uh -huh. um, I surrendered to a call that I'd heard when I was 14 that God would use me as some kind of a minister and at that age I immediately not long after that I needed to begin teaching and leading small groups uh, we, Ron and I laugh. We both started ministry the same year. Next year we'll both celebrate 50 years in the ministry. Um, and then when I was 19 years old, I was licensed to be a minister, and uh, and things began to develop and work. And and uh, we had spent some time in South Louisiana early. As a matter of fact, that's where we were living. We weren't living together where we were living when we got married and uh but we got out of god's will that was me not her we moved back to florida uh and uh, stayed about two years and you know god's good even there even though we were not where we were supposed to be i told our congregation recently i said the scripture says the psalmist said my my lines have fallen to me in pleasant places and sometimes we try to create our own lines, and I did. And even though we were not 
uh, uh, holding on to the lines that God had placed, he was still honored her. So anyway, ultimately moved back to South Louisiana to help a man with a church out there, one of the men who had married us, and help him with a, of course this is 1975, so we, were, we had a coffee house too. And uh, so we moved out there. I was gonna lead worship for him and just help him do some teaching in the coffee house and such, and uh, had a little church. And it uh, wasn't long before he called me out in the front yard of his house and he said, hey, uh, I'm moving to uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and uh, I'm gonna take a church over there. Here are the keys, you're now the pastor of this church. I'm 20 years old. <laughs> well, my goodness. So did that. Wound up merging that church with another congregation, became an associate pastor to a man. Did that for a couple of years, and then uh, even though I knew um, the teachers, we call them the teachers, Brother Charles Simpson and Don Bash and Bob Mumford and Derek Prince and Ern Baxter, I, I became acquainted with uh, Brother Charles Simpson and some of the gentlemen uh, in his network and became, then ultimately resigned my place with that church and became affiliated uh, at the time. And uh, Brother Curtis Foreman was my pastor. And so we, we founded a church there. We were in a little town in South Louisiana called Homa, H-O-U-M-A, named after the Homa Indian tribe. And uh, so I thought, this is it. This is what I'm gonna do the rest of my life. And so we, we of course, did the business of the kingdom the best we could there. It was a house church. I love house church. And I've asked God many times, why in the world did you put me in a traditional church? I love house church. But anyway, that's his business, not mine. And so we did that for a while. And then uh, along about the middle 80s, it became clear through the voice of the Holy Spirit that, uh, it was, that we should move to Tennessee. We had actually spent a year in Mobile as a sabbatical. And when we were done with that, I thought God would have us uh, found a church, a house church in Mandeville, Louisiana, where we lived in Mandeville for a year. And God said, no, this is not where you're supposed to be. And so through, through uh, a word, I mean a clear word, and understanding God's will, we, in 1986, we moved to Tennessee. And uh, at the same time, a lot of people moved to Tennessee. And we were a cult. Everybody knew. Everybody moved from other states, and that was a joke. Y'all supposed to laugh at that, but uh, <laughs> but we, a bunch of people moved, including my pastor, the Kurtz Foreman, and so uh, the gentleman who was already there, who was the pastor of a local congregation, we we just, uh, just chose to go get uh, a vocation because the church wasn't going to be big enough to support three ministers, uh, and so I went I, I went into a sales field. This was about the time, and of course that went great for a while, but then I began to get into a place that I'll just call disillusionment. I began to say to God, well, you know, I've been pastoring basically since I was 20, and I've been doing ministry since before that, and here I am 12, 13 years later, and I have done that, exclusively that, during my career building years, and now here I am needing a job. And what's going on? And I spent some time in, in just in a place of disillusionment. I actually uh, allowed some separate, or I allowed separation between me and my pastor for a while, for a, a few months. I wasn't robbing banks, I wasn't killing people, but I wasn't really walking with God like I should have. Our marriage suffered. It was uh, it was uh, threatened. It was in uh, anyway. It was threatened. And uh, it's only God's grace that we survived. And then one day, of course, I began to think, I've got this calling, and yet God's not, he's not using me, my calling the way I thought he was going to, or, you know, he just wasn't using me like I thought he should. And, you know, he, he's, for some reason, he didn't listen to me. <laughs> one day, I got a pastoral letter in the mail from Brother Charles Simpson. He still sends those out every month. Somewhere in that letter, it said something like this, and I, I don't know why I wrote it and keep it. It said, you think that God has forgotten you, and you think God has laid your calling aside, 
but he hasn't. And I thought, how did Brother Charles know to write that to me? <laughs> and of course, he didn't, but the Holy Spirit took that like a dagger and pushed it into my heart. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say this, just as clear as anybody said it to me. Get back on where you got off. So I called Curtis, and I said, hey, I need to meet you. There was a sizzling steakhouse down the road. That's how long ago it was. I need to meet you down there. And so we met, and I told him, I said, the Holy Spirit has shown me that I'm not where I need to be, but I need to get back on where I got off. And we met, and of course, a record, we didn't reconcile because we weren't enemies, but we reunited. And, uh, and of course, he's still a very good friend today to me. And, um, and so that began a trek of going back. And then God began to uh, use me to help pastors. And I, I actually, at some point, uh, left Curtis as my pastor with good standing. We weren't mad at each other. So that I could go over across town and help a gentleman uh, who was based out of Panama City. And I had come up under his father-in-law. As a matter of fact, it was his father-in-law that actually financially sent us to Louisiana. But I thought, well, Lord, I'd be okay with this, with helping and supporting pastors. Literally, the rest of my life, I was good for that. I had a good sales job with a nationally known company. I was fine with that. And this went on for a while. And, uh, and then through uh, just a sovereign... Uh, move through a, a word that I felt clear from the Holy Spirit and through counsel from Brother Charles Simpson, uh, we left that particular work and went uh, to B Abundant Life Church. Brother Charles, I said, Brother Charles, we're, we're ready to come home relationally. And uh, I said, what can I do? And he said, well, I'm working with a young man over at Abundant Life Church. If you could go over there and help him, you'd be helping me. I said, well, Done deal. So we went over to Abundant Life Church uh, with the idea that I was going to help this fellow. We became friends, and, and we were you know, doing what we could. Um, what I didn't know, and I'm not going to go into any details here, what I didn't know is there were some issues that I was unaware of. And uh, when I showed up, uh, the it was 1998, I showed up, he wasn't there, and I said, where, where is, and they said, well, the elders have given him a three month sabbatical because he has some illness that he needs to deal with. I said, well, that's good, I mean, I appreciate that. About this time, I started hearing something in the back of my mind. The Holy Spirit said, you, you might ought to prepare yourself. And of course, as you can see where this is headed, ultimately, he resigned, this particular guy resigned. And uh, it wasn't long after that, the elders asked me to join their group of elders. They called it a board, but I didn't like that word. And so I did, I joined the, I joined the group and uh, there was some controversy. There was a lot of people that accused myself and a good friend of running this guy off so that I could take it to church. And I can assure you nothing is farther from the truth. As a matter of fact, I told my best friend at the time, who was another one of the elders, I said, uh, I said, I know I don't have this authority, but I forbid you for mentioning my name as the, the, the next pastor of this church, because I, I will not accept it if you bring it up. He didn't. But the best friend of the former pastor did. We were in an elders meeting, and he looked over at me. He said, that's the next pastor right there. And I thought, how odd is this, that the best friend? So I said, and they asked me, would I quote, unquote, come out of retirement? And I, again, I was settled. I was good with just spending the rest of my life being a support. And I still have a heart for that. I still as much as I can, try to help guys, support them, encourage them. And, uh, but I thought that was it. The Lord is for so, so they called it coming out of retirement. I had, I had a pretty good sales job, company car, the whole thing. And my wife and I talked and we still had two kids at home, but I said, yes, we'll do that. And then 
on uh, first Sunday in March 2001, then uh, Brother Charles and the elders installed myself in as the pastor of Mount Life Church. That's 22 years ago. Uh, it's a miracle in many ways, but it also demonstrates God's faithfulness. I thought of this verse, if I can see it. Many of you are familiar with the end of 1 Thessalonians 5. Now may God, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The next verse says this. He who calls you is faithful. Mm. He who calls you is faithful. Can we say that together? He who calls you is faithful. And that's not all it says. Not only is he faithful, it says, who also will do it. During that time of disillusionment, during that time of wondering what God was doing, some of you remember Brother John Duke. And uh, John Duke was highly instrumental in my life, and he's the one that helped get me connected to Curtis Foreman. But I don't remember where we were, but one day John looked at me during that time, and he said, Brother Larry, Romans 11 says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. And I said, say that again, John. The gifts, and I knew the scripture, but you know how it is? The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. God's not taking it back. And he said, and the, the calling that God has on your life is irrevocable. Not only is it irrevocable, God does not want it back. It encouraged me. And so, you know, while this may not be as dynamic of an issue as some that we've heard, uh, it's, it's a challenging one nonetheless. And, uh, you know, over the last 22 years, we've been able to just, you know, just serve God and minister the best we can uh, in, in that community of Mount Juliet. God's given me a place in the community. Uh, in many ways, uh, but I had to go through that time, I had to go through that season of wondering what God was doing. And then looking back, we see the hand of God on all of that, orchestrating the path. I don't know how much longer I'll be the pastor of Lone of Life Church. They'll probably fire me when I get back, I don't know. I'm not planning on doing anything else, but you never know. Just like I didn't know that at some point I didn't know that I would be the next pastor. But I'm willing to do whatever God wants and to go wherever he wants. I'm willing to stay there till, till, till I die if that's what he wants and I have the grace to do it. But that's the journey and that's certainly abbreviated tremendously. But that's the journey that brought me to where I am today. And I have many, many good stories along the way. I have some that are not so good. I'm not getting into those, except the one I've already told you. But I just want to tell you that if I touched a nerve today, if, if your heart went, yeah, I, I have a calling that I've wondered about. Where in the world is it? Or what, when am I going to be able to use it? What am I going to do? I remember as a teenager thinking, God, you called me to be a minister. And I, you know, I, what are you gonna do with me? And uh, funny story, I was uh, out on, I, uh, some of the work I did as a teenager, late teenager, was longshoring work. Anybody done any longshoreman work? Probably not. Longshoreman work is uh, a port, big ship, and you're loading a stock, and we were loading big rolls of paper from the paper mill. And bales of paper from the paper mill. And buddy, it was hard work. And uh, I was standing out on the dock one day, this is again, this is 1974 probably. 
and w w one of the guys comes up behind me and uh, I've got, believe it or not, I've got long hair. 1974, imagine that. Longer than Curtis's. It was down to here and this guy comes up behind me and grabs me. He says, somebody told me you're a preacher. I said, yeah, I've been called into the ministry. He said, you can't be a preacher with long hair. And, you know, young and dumb. I said, well, just watch me. <laughs> and that's the kind of stuff you ran into back then. And, you know, even then I thought, Lord, when is this going to stop? And I just want to say to you that if if that's you, if, you, if you're having that thought of knowing God's called you and knowing he's gifted you, and yet you haven't seen yet the fruition of the exercise of that gift, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just, I'm not going to have anybody come up front unless Ron overrules me. But I want you just to stand where you are and, and acknowledge that. And then I, I would like to just say something to you and then pray over you. So if that's you, then go ahead and stand. And if not, then we will move on. And Larry, just to step, not to be just to call to be a pastor. Oh, no, any calling. Yeah, no, we're not talking about just being right. a pastor. Any, if you have a call on your life, and listen, uh, what does the scripture say? We walk worthy of the vocation right. yeah. to which you've been called. It's not just ministry. Anybody else? Now I want to say to you gentlemen, you've already heard it, but this time I want to say it to you. And this is the Holy Spirit through the living and active Word of God speaking to you, and that is the gifts of God and the callings of God. The gift and the calling that you have received from God is irrevocable. Mm 